Welcome to this tutorial where we are going to be talking about the major features of the structure of our humerus. Knowing our bone structures and features are important because they allow us a better understanding of where things attach and how bones interact with each other. And the first structure I will highlight here now is the head of our humerus. Now, just before I do that quickly, I'll just write down, we've got our, our proximal and distal ends of the bone. And an anterior view. And posterior, so the front and back view of that bone. Now, I've just highlighted the head of the humerus here. And it is going to make up the humeral part of our glenohumeral joint, the most freely movable joint we have in our body. Now we can see that it has a spherical or ball shape, which helps us easily identify it as a ball and socket type joint. The next feature we will look at straight below our humeral head is the anatomical neck of the humerus that I'm outlining here now. The neck of the bone will always be uh, straight below the head, so one that's also easy to identify and remember. Uh, the uh, feature that I've highlighted here in the green is called the greater tubercle. We also have a, a lesser tubercle that I'll highlight next, and they are both for muscle attachments. So we have our greater tubercle that's uh, more superior to the lesser tubercle, which is uh, more toward the middle of the bone. So we have our lesser tubercle there in the blue, and the greater tubercle in the green, both for muscle attachments. Between those two tubercles, we have a structure known as the intertubercular sulcus or intertubercular groove. And it's going to be a point where the uh, long head of our biceps brachii muscle or where that tendon can uh, slide through and it uh, won't dislodge from that area. I've just put that there in the red between the two tubercles and I'll show it again in a brighter red. The tendon of the biceps brachii or the long head is going to go through that groove or sulcus there. Now just down toward the middle of the bone we have the deltoid tuberosity which is going to be the attachment point for our deltoid muscle. So that one's in the name, very hard to forget and we can see it just in the orange here. So it's a muscle attachment for your deltoid. This next one I'll outline as I'm talking about it called the radial groove or radial sulcus. Goes just through here along the uh, posterior aspect of the bone. And it's going to be a point or like an indentation where our radial nerve and deep brachial artery are going to uh, slide through. Now when we uh, flex our muscles and tense our muscles of the upper part of the arm, they can compress nerves and arteries and uh, we don't want to compress nerves so we have a spot, a groove, where that nerve and the deep brachial artery are going to fit into. Once again on the posterior aspect of the bone, now uh, down toward the distal end, I've just highlighted the medial supracondylar ridge. We have a lateral supracondylar ridge which I'll talk about in a minute. And these also are just muscle attachment points. When we do a course on our musculoskeletal anatomy, we'll talk about the exact muscles that attach to all these uh, different bone structures. But for now, all we need to know is it's uh, for muscle attachment. Next on the distal ends of the bone, we have our coronoid fossa, which we can see on the anterior surface of the bone, and our olecranon fossa, which we can see on the posterior surface. Both of these fossas are indentations or depressions that act as articulation points for the bones of our forearm. So we've got the coronoid fossa anteriorly and the olecranon fossa posteriorly. And just at the distal end of our anterior humerus, we can see in that uh, salmon ink color again that I've highlighted the lateral supracondylar ridge, which again, same thing, it's going to be a muscle attachment point. Moving on from our condylar ridges, 
we can see our epicondyles just below them. So I'm going to highlight the epicondyles both at the same time. As with everything, we're going to have a medial and a lateral. So I'll just show those here. Our medial epicondyle is for muscle and ligament attachment. Medial on the inside surface here, and we've got it on both sides. We can see it from both aspects. Our lateral epicondyles on the outer surface of the bone are going to function in very much the same way, also going to act as muscle and ligament attachment points. So lateral epicondyles. And if we think back to the first couple of videos I made on our bony structures or bony landmarks, we can remember that we, we, we've seen all these names already. We've seen the name tubercle, we've seen the name uh, epicondyle and condyle and, and fossa. We know what they all mean and when we see them on each bone they always mean the same thing, so it's a standard feature. In the uh, pale pink here I've just highlighted the trochlea. Uh, the trochlea is going to form part of the distal end of our humerus, which is going to act as an articulation point for the hinge joint that makes up our elbow. So we have the trochlea, we can see it on both the anterior and posterior aspects. In the orange I've just highlighted the capitulum. The capitulum again is going to act as an articulation point and will articulate with a depression in the head of our radius of the forearm. The last feature we have on our humerus here is called the radial fossa. The radial fossa I've just highlighted at the distal end of the bone here in the pink. The radial fossa, like our coronoid fossa and our olecranon fossa, is just going to be for articulation, this time with the radius, and we can see it on our anterior aspect. Now, this covers all of the features that you will see on your humerus. Like I said in a later musculoskeletal video, we'll have a look at the exact muscles that all of these structures interact with. But for now, I hope this has been helpful. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon.